Hey tribe, welcome to HDDC, HG Designs Crochet. Now today, I've got another boss talk lined up for you, and so I'm just doing the introduction before we go into that. So for anyone new to the channel, hi, hello, welcome. You have joined partway through the C2C series, which is the Crochet to Cash series, and I am bringing as much information as possible to you so that you can turn your passion into an income. I kicked off the series with 10 ways to make an income from yarn and I will link those above for you and I have also started a boss talk series within that. We've already spoken to Rosina of Zine and Rogers about how to submit to a magazine and today we have got Nicola from The Secret Crocheter and she is going to talk to us about what it's like running a full-time crochet business. So make sure you've got your cuppa and your crochet ready and enjoy this and I'll catch up with you after. Hi, thank you for coming onto the channel. <laughs> um, do you want to introduce yourself to everybody here today? Yeah, um, I am Nicola, I am the secret crocheter and I live in Wiltshire. Which isn't too far from me, I'm in Leicestershire, so. Okay. <laughs> um, too far. And I'm running a series all about, um, well, the series is called C2C, Crochet to Cash, and it's for anybody that wants to start a side hustle or a full-time income from this wonderful yarn that we all love. Um, and so today, I was hoping that you could talk about the courses you do and tell us all about the studio, your little shed that you're in. It's not little, the big shed. <laughs> <laughs> the crochet cabin, the crochet cabin. Um, so, do you want to start with maybe how you got into crochet and then how it progressed from there? Yeah, okay. So, um, my mum taught me to crochet when I was about eight years old. Um, but obviously, it wasn't really cool to crochet, like to take your crochet to primary school or anything. So, I remember crocheting a bit at home, um, like with my mum. And then my mum taught my nan to crochet as well. So, we all used to sit there and do a little bit. But then I didn't do any for years and years and years. And then probably about six or seven years ago, my friend and I were both struggling a little bit with mental health. And um, she was like, let's go and do a craft workshop somewhere. And I was like, really? She's like, yeah, yeah, come on, come on. It will be brilliant. So uh, she decided on crochet. She's like, let's go to this. There's a lady. She's teaching crochet. Let's go and do it. And I said, I think I can already crochet, but I'll, you know, it's fine. Let's go. Yeah. So we went and um, turns out I could crochet. Um, and I just absolutely loved it. I've never, I'm a primary school teacher by trade and you're always teaching, you're always teaching all the time. And apart from courses that you go on in school, I'd never, I'd never gone anywhere where I'd learn anything like for me, like for a personal thing. And it just blew my mind, like being taught something that was absolutely nothing to do with my day job. Um, and I just, I just loved it. I just like completely fell in love with it and then became quite obsessed with it. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think we all do. You fall into it hard. Yeah. The yarn starts to creep in and then oh. those projects, where do you store them? <laughs> yeah, I think the like the first Christmas after I'd like learned again to crochet, I think everybody just bought me wool for Christmas and I lined them up all in a row and I had about 35 balls of wool for Christmas. I was like, this is the best Christmas ever. <laughs> it's a good Christmas. <laughs> and then from there, you how did it then progress into the secret crocheter? So, um, so I was just, it was just a hobby, just a straightforward hobby. So I was just crocheting at home, sort of in my spare time, using it as a bit of a release, like from school, because it can be quite stressful being a teacher. Um, and then I was crocheting so much, my husband said, if you don't start selling some of this, we're going to have to move because it's, it's taking over the, the house. And he built me this little corner in the house. Well, it started with a basket. It was just a basket put on my wool in and then it was like a unit in the corner of the room and then it was a unit two shelves and the basket <laughs> you know what I mean and then it then it was a whole shelving unit down one side and it just it was like you're gonna need 
you're going to need to do something because we can't like we can't carry on like this so I thought okay so I did like the school Christmas market and sold a little bit of stuff and that was that was sort of quite nice um, and then a few people had asked if I would teach them to crochet but obviously I was a full-time teacher I was a deputy head of my primary school and you can't be seen to be having too much fun outside of your job <laughs> yeah so that's why I'm the secret crocheter so nobody knew what I was doing really so it started off very low-key taught a few friends to crochet um, you know I started my Facebook page and my Instagram page but never showed my face it was just this is what I've made these two ladies have been to crochet today and it's just grown from there really you know then sort of advertising on the Facebook page that I could teach you you know on a Saturday morning if you wanted to come and because I then taught sort of a group of people to crochet they then wanted the next thing so we can crochet now we can do straight lines can we make this or can we make that and it just it it just grew and grew and grew to the point where I then moved into the conservatory with um so I was doing workshops in the conservatory but it means I would have to bring everything down from upstairs and lay it all out and then when they'd gone take it all back upstairs again and pack it away and then have another workshop bring it all back down lay it all out put a few kits out um and then I said to my husband can, can I have a can I have a small <laughs> a small like shed in the garden a cabin and he was like well I don't think you'll use it much but yeah okay and he hasn't really seen me now for <laughs> the years oh gosh wow so yeah it really did grow and now you've got do you want to give us a little yeah so now I've got this is the crochet cabin um so this is where I teach uh, all my workshops and where I come to work each day if you see what I mean so I leave the house Wow. Um, come out to work, go home for lunch, um, come back out in the afternoon and then go home in the evening. Because I think one of the things we were going to talk about is how to keep it separate, the hobby and the job separate. So I come to work every day yeah. and then I go home each night. And whatever I take home with me is like the fun crochet, I suppose, if that makes sense. So if it's something for myself yeah. or if it's just mindless crochet, that, that will come home with me. Yeah. But ev everything work related stays out here. Yeah. And I really like that. I've started to do the same in that um, I've got the projects I'm working on for work and then projects I'm working on for me. And in the yes. evening, it's for me. But it does tend to just be granny squares because they're mindless and you just keep going so yeah I do really like that and then you've got that separation then um is, does your husband still complain about yarn in the house or is it all in the cabin uh well it's um I now I'm just gonna have to jump ahead I now sell um t-shirt yarn so <laughs> which is my new favorite yarn so um because I haven't got enough room for it sort of down here and he even built me a stash which is which I'll show you in a minute which is behind me it's still not big enough <laughs> so so there's now um in the in the office upstairs so my husband's working from home now so in the office upstairs he sits facing out the window for like you know to help his mental work health and all behind him is all the <laughs> stuff that won't fit in here or out there and it's basically just t-shirt yarn and um you know boxes <laughs> kits. so uh yeah i haven't quite got away with it yet but no <laughs> but that's that's i think that's a good balance because you have tried <laughs> i have i've made a real effort i love that so i know one of the things that i get asked a lot is how to work out pricing people don't know what is a good price for a course so would you be able to you don't have to show your prices, but just your formula of what you need to take into account. Well, you have to take into account um, your tools of, you know, so if they're bringing their own hooks or if you're supplying the hooks, if you're supplying the wool, how long it's taken me to prepare for the workshop. Because essentially a, a workshop is just like my lessons in school. You know, I still have to plan them. So how long is the plan? Um, how long do I think they're going to be here for? 
So is it an hour's workshop? Is it an hour and a half's workshop? Is it a three hour workshop? Because you have to take in your time. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of have to think about how many people you're going to allow to come to the workshop Mm -hmm. and base your price on that. But what if you only fill three out of the six spaces? It's almost you've got to make that work as well. So, and I also, you know, and I do a bit of research. I see what, what other workshops cost what you know and think about what would I pay yeah all that and what else are they getting so all my ladies get like loads of tea and biscuits and sometimes we have cake and all sorts really so you kind of have to take all that into consideration as well yeah but you enjoy every moment of it I do I absolutely love it I've, I've just met so many people as well like when you're in when you're in primary school it's it's very like tunnel vision you only ever think about your children in your class and their parents and the people you work with and you don't really realize well I never realized there was this massive world out there of wonderful people and people with different backgrounds and stories and I love it I've just loved meeting people and I'm not really like that I'm I always thought I was a bit um like a bit of an introvert not really not really very sociable but I think that was just the school (laughs) I think getting out into the real world I'm like yeah I love this I love meeting people I love I love it when I get a new person to the workshop but equally I love seeing all the ladies who just keep coming back if yeah. you get to know them really well then yeah and then they do you put on extra courses for them as they want to learn things which is really good yes yeah so they'll say oh can we make some <clears throat> and I'm like yeah yeah we can do that I'll put it on the list for next year <laughs> that's fine that is really good because then they're guiding you into what they want which is always useful yeah yeah it is it's good to it's good to be able to do what they want to do and sort of be led by them but as well as me saying I'll tell you what we're going to do next month we're going to make and they're like oh yeah yeah that'll be good that'll be good that is really good and then I think it's really important like you said mental health I think any sort of craft and mental health go hand in hand and I when I started to crochet my grandmother taught me and it was during uni and it was so pressured and crochet was like a release and it was how you sort of step back and like you said sometimes you can have a tunnel vision and crochet helps you to step back and see that there's more going on around you and I think a lot of people certainly within my viewers as well have said crochet is a way for their mental health Um, and it's really important to acknowledge that and take that time and then the fact that you've managed to make it into your income as well is even more fun yeah yeah it's um when I was really I was really really poorly at one point with um anxiety and I used to have panic attacks but for some reason if I had a ball of wool and a hook in my bag I knew that it wouldn't be as bad I knew that if I started feeling a bit funny as soon as I got my wool and my hook out and I just did I don't know make a flower just just chain it just helped me to focus I don't know whether that's the right word or I I just calmed down completely and sometimes I'd even have it in my pocket like the smallest ball of wool and a hook in my pocket and if I was out somewhere but I wasn't confident enough to get my like wool and hook out I'd just hold it in my pocket and I'd think yeah I'll I'll be all right now I know I'll know I'll be all right I'm not gonna I'm not gonna have a panic attack in this situation it was weird 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 really because I don't know whether (laughs) it was actually working but it, it would really, really calm me down. And it, sometimes I could only go somewhere if I took my crochet with me. Um, yeah, I'm like, and, you know, I my friends to. were like, do you want to come out for a coffee? And I'm like, yeah, but I'm going to have to, <laughs> I'm going to have to crochet at the same time. And obviously all my good friends were like, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Yeah. And that's kind of how I got better in a way, really, is doing that enough until I felt really comfortable. and confident to be out in the open yeah you do get people look at you but I do think when you've got anxiety you feel like people are looking at you anyway so at least with this you know that you're okay and then you don't really care what other people have got to say no no I I couldn't give a monkeys these days if I want to get my crochet out I'm going to get my crochet out I don't and you're right you do get I can't remember where we were and somebody was looking and I think she said look at her doing her knitting and I'm like well for one it's not knitting (laughs) um but I don't care I really don't care no you need to be happy and do what makes you happy and you can't please everybody you really can't 
been no. done to either. No, that's right. That's right. So then you had your cabin made, and then yes. how many people do you normally have in your classes without the virus? So without the virus, I could have seven. Yeah. So I've got I can have five around the table, and I've got a sofa, and I might have two on the sofa, depending on what the workshop was. Yeah. Um, now we're in well <clears throat> when we were allowed to have workshops then i reduced it to four four around the table plus me um and actually that's a better number than seven really and i think whenever there's a back to normal i don't think i'll go back to having seven people i think i'll stick with the four um and just do that because it's i don't know it's a bit more intimate i can i can help more people obviously if there's somebody struggling then i can get to them yeah. um so yeah and then i've got the little stash so often when they've had their workshop they'll go out and do some shopping in the stash because that's where all the kits are and the accessories and bits and pieces like that that sounds really good i think when you try to teach and you've got a few people you feel like they've got a weight but when there's just the four you can really focus and then they, yes. might, they might move along quicker as well because they've had more of your time so that's really good yeah and then what do you sell in your stash? Um, okay, so I've brought some examples in to show you. So uh, I've got the t-shirt yarn. That's, I've never used t-shirt yarn. Oh my God, you've got to use it. Tell us I'll, send you, I'll it. send you some, I'll send you some. It is awesome. And wow. you can make things like baskets with it and bags. Um, wait there a minute, wait there. <laughs> oh that's so cool yes i really want to make a bag oh oh the basket or baskets yeah that's lovely it's quite an arm ache using it you know like when you crochet it's a, like a wrist movement but with with the t-shirt yarn it's more of a we have a bit of a workout and we have a bit of a sweat and um yeah, the ladies feel like they've been to the gym when we use t-shirt yarn. Uh, so I've also got little kits. Wow, what's in that? That makes, yeah. can you see that all right? Little this kits. Um, oh, I like that. Very yeah, cool. I call that my smoothie kit. Uh, necklaces. Sweeties, yeah. I really like that as well. Ice cream. <laughs> All that it, makes, it makes a little flower brooch. Uh, oh, so that makes a little crocheted birdie. That's cute. Um, I've got a little Christmas kit. One of the Christmas kits. Can you see that makes a little gingerbread house? Yeah, in the ball ball. And then every other month, I do a mystery kit. Oh, that's cool. So this is the last one, all the rest have sold. It's the last one left and it's called Pull the Other One, but you don't know what it is until you open it. Oh, that's good. So that, that's quite exciting. And then, apart from all the kits and things, and I sell hooks, then I've started making yeah. sort of accessories. So crochet hook case. I've had some... Uh, Queen of the crochet. <laughs> pencils made. I've made some birthday cards. That's a good one. That's a really good one. And notepads. Ooh. So there's loads in there. There's um so all that's online as well, but then it's all it's all out in the stash and uh Oh my goodness, where there's wool, there's a way. <laughs> I love that. And you make all of these yourself. Where there's wool, there's a way. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i keep myself busy thing is again if we're talking about um like cash to crochet you've got to you can't i don't think you can just make money by making scarves and selling them you've got to kind of think about other outlets yeah. just does that make sense so somebody said to me um before i made the transition you can't make a living out of crochet and i was like well I bloody can and I will but I think what they meant was you can't just crochet scarves and sell them that isn't that isn't going to be a sustainable income but if you can think of right well I can I can make stuff and sell it I can also write patterns 
I can also put those patterns into kits. I can also do workshops. I can also start investigating accessories because I know that my, you know, my ladies go mad over a pencil, you know, that who wouldn't, who wouldn't, (laughs) but do you see what I mean? You've got to, and I'm led by them as well. So I've started wearing my, um, hoodies and they're like oh can you make me one of them can you make me one of them and I'm like yeah actually I can um and then next year I've got a membership group starting called um cabin crew so again that's another <laughs> that's another way of making yeah. a different income so it, it's still crochet income but you've got to try and think about you know different avenues I suppose diversifying the income streams of out doubt because I I'm the same I know you can, people will say you can't make money you can you can make a living out of crochet um and you might have a different idea of success from millionaire to money in the bank but you can make it work of course you can yeah it's a different income streams like I have got YouTube ad revenue um and then patreon and different things but if you were to rely on one that might leave you a bit anxious but to have multiple exactly and then in in our current situation you know if i was only relying on workshops i'd be screwed now (laughs) so um but i've got a website with kits on i've got an etsy shop with kits and patterns on yeah i've got the stash that they can come and do their essential shopping in that is essential (laughs) that really is you could also do um when you send the kits out you could always host a little zoom night and everyone could sit and make them yeah 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 we're gonna do some well we're gonna have that in the cabin crew uh membership next year we're gonna have some facebook lives and things um and i often stick a video on my facebook page and my instagram page anyway so the last one was making poppies uh you know remembrance day poppies so yeah, it's a good way to keep people involved and to make them feel, you know, part of the community. And that's what people want. I think it's very easy to feel lonely, especially now. And crochet yeah. unites us. So it does. Um, it does, yeah. I love to crochet with company because I don't really have many real life crocheters in my life. Um, but my tribe stars, I do a Zoom with them every month and we sit and crochet and I get to see what they're working on. It's so much fun. <laughs> yeah yeah we do a uh, yarn and yap here so um twice a month again it's lower numbers at the moment and not at all at the moment but lower numbers so um yarn and yap you just come bring your crochet have a cup of tea um to be honest there's very little crochet that goes on it's more yapping <laughs> than yarning and uh but it's fun and it's nice and now the ladies have started to get to know each other now they're in the facebook group together so they all know who's got grandchildren who's got a new dog who's got a puppy and so they they're all talking they don't even need me a lot of the time i I very rarely get involved in the group because they're all they're all talking to each other and um i can just sit back and watch that's lovely it's really nice um so one of my questions for me is how did it go from part-time to full-time and how you made that choice okay so um i was a full-time deputy head yeah and i was doing some workshops well some learn to crochet lessons at the weekend on a saturday usually just on a saturday morning which sometimes went into a saturday afternoon which was which was fine so i wasn't telling anybody that was the secret crochet part of it nobody knew And then we had, there was an October half term and I thought, I'm going to, I'm going to try this and see what happens. And I put workshops on every day of half term. So a couple of learn to crochets, a couple of um, workshops to make those scarves, hats, fingerless gloves, things like that. And I think I managed to take about 500 pounds in an October half term. Um, in you know just in the week and I was like bloody hell (laughs) like it surprised me it it surprised me more than anything and so that kind of got me thinking well that's that's quite an interesting situation to be in Um, and then on top of that school was getting really tricky 
Um, I wasn't enjoying it. I kept having these sort of mini meltdowns where I'd say to my husband, I don't think I want to be a teacher anymore. And he was like, oh yeah, you do, you do. Of course you do. You know, that's all you've done. You've been teaching for 16 years. It, it's fine. I'm like, I don't, I don't think I like it. Um, and he was like, but you hate it. Do you absolutely hate it? And I said, no, I don't hate it. I don't hate it, but I don't want to be doing this till I'm 60. I, I've got quite a long, well, fingers crossed, I've got quite a long career span left. I don't, I don't think I can keep, I don't think I can keep doing this. And previously I would, I loved my job. I absolutely loved it. And I'd look forward to the holidays. And after about two weeks in, I'd be ready to go back to school because I love the routine. And then it started to do the opposite where I would, I just couldn't, I was living for the holidays yeah. and I was dreading going back. And then I'd get back and after a week or so, it'd be all right. Yeah, I'm back into it now. But that kept happening and it wasn't a, it wasn't a nice feeling, really. Um, so I did some sort of figures with sums and things. And luckily, because I'm a teacher, I can do supply teaching, which yeah. pays really, really well. So I made the decision to resign from my job. So I left in July 2018 and I started doing some supply teaching. So supply teaching, I could work however many days I wanted, one day a week, two days a week, three days a week, but it meant I could start at half eight and I'd be home by half past three, which is very different from your yeah. normal teaching job. Nothing to do in the evenings, nothing to do at weekends. So I started building up the business by doing that. So doing supply, teaching more workshops in the evenings having sort of like an admin day in the week where I wouldn't do supply, but I'd get on top of social media and newsletters and pattern writing and things like that. But I was still getting an income, albeit less than what I was on, which meant we could adjust sort of financially. Yeah. But then it got to the point where there was a growing demand for the workshops and the, everything going on here. And when I was in school, I was starting to miss phone calls from people wanting to book or I was missing or I'd have an email saying hi Nicola can I book on this and I'm like I can't really reply till I get home and I was worried that I'd miss them you know that they'd forget or hi Nicola can I buy your so-and-so kit and I'll be like oh god like <laughs> come on I need to get home so it started impacting on that um, and then I stopped enjoying the supply as well really so it got to December last year and I thought right I'm gonna go for it because you don't know until you try and I thought if I, I'd rather know now it's not gonna work yeah. than keep doing this for another couple of years and it's just prolonging the the agony of it not working if that makes sense so I thought I'm just gonna go for it so I did <laughs> and that was that was January oh wow <laughs> and then three months later the world sort of woof. yeah but like you said, until you go for it, you just don't know. And even with the virus raging, you're still doing really well. I think if you're in the craft industry at the moment, like you're all right, I think. <laughs> yeah, because everybody's home and they, they are, they are, I've had a lot of people, and I guess you have, reached out saying, I need something to occupy my time. I'm bored for my anxiety, for my mental health. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. I've had lots of people wanting to learn to crochet. I've had a lot of people who have taught themselves over lockdown and then are coming saying, right, I've taught myself to crochet over lockdown. Have you got any kits or patterns I could try? I'm a real beginner. Or um, are there any workshops that would move me on to the next stage? Um, so I've done a learn to crochet kit now, which is great. But then I'm going to start recording some online tutorials for like the next part even for my ladies, because I don't know when I'll be able to have them back now. Um, but I know that some of them are ready to move on and I don't want to lose them. Yeah. So I'm going to just do some, some little videos for them. That's great. Yeah. And I'm glad that you uh, took that leap because it's inspiring for anyone else that, that is on that edge to also take that leap. You've, you've just got to have a go. It's really hard work. You know, it is, it is hard work and one of the I think one of the questions you asked me about was um the best thing about working for yourself and there's there's massive satisfaction in putting that together and then someone buying it yeah. and 
like what is it 12 pounds and i'm like that's my 12 pounds yeah. <laughs> like i've earned 12 pounds and like with my teaching salary it was always there and it was great but there's more there's kind of i get a bigger sense of fulfillment from you somebody buying that from me yeah. than than getting my salary every month which is always the same i'm not saying it's a bad thing but you know the, the money i make i've made yeah. from my from my hard work and every month it's different and yeah that makes sense sort of it's a real sense of achievement of yeah i've sold four of those that month <laughs> and that you know so it's it is good I, I love i love that side of it you've put the work in and you see the reward from it whereas i'm in a corporate job i'm a trainee solicitor so i make tons of money for that company but i don't really get the reward for it whereas when I put a pattern out and someone sells it even now I still do a dance and it's over 300 orders in I'm like Ooh! <laughs> yeah yeah exactly exactly that's exactly how I feel there's a real I don't know and you could say that with you know with teaching I'm teaching a child to do something I should get that feeling of reward and I think I used to yeah. and then it it stopped I don't know why I don't know where it went but it, it just stopped um but I've still, I still meet that sort of teaching itch in me because I'm teaching the ladies to crochet and a group of four ladies is no different from a group of 35 kids. You know, they still chat too much. <laughs> they, you know, they don't listen sometimes. Um, it's exactly the same. So you still, you know, but at the end of the workshop, they've all made something and they're all really pleased with themselves. And I'm like, yay, you've done it, you know? So, um, yeah, I love, I love that side of it. And I guess actually it's quite enlightening because you've had transferable skills from your your trade job, so to speak, and then you've transferred that into your own business now, which is really, really handy. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, I've learned a lot. Like I've had to learn a lot about social media and business and tax and buying stuff and all, you know, all those types of things. But in terms of day to day teaching, I think one of the things I think a lot about is, you know, children are often nervous. They can be nervous in class. They don't want to say, I don't understand what you've said. I don't, I don't know what you mean. So in a workshop, I've always got that at the forefront of my mind. You know, I'm saying all this stuff. What if one of them doesn't understand? Will they say? And I always say, just say, as soon as you don't understand, just say it. Don't worry about anyone else around the table because they're all thinking the same thing. They don't understand either. <coughs> um, so I'm always kind of, thinking that and when I've got a new lady coming I'm trying to think right how's she going to feel she's going to be nervous because she doesn't know anybody she's going to wonder what kind of crazy woman I have having this cabin in my garden so I always try to make them feel really really welcome when they come and at home and introduce everybody and I get my regulars coming all the time so I'll always make a joke about one of my regulars you know so this is Tracy she's got her own key because she's always here so much and you know like to put yeah. people at ease really yeah no that's lovely because i think sometimes people worry they don't have a <coughs> to start their business but you don't need it you just use the skills that you already have yeah i don't have any any business qualifications i've got my teaching degree and that's it so you did run it you were a deputy head at a school so you, that's that's pretty formidable <laughs> you're good you're good at that admin and keeping things going which is good and you've got to be organized You've got to be able to plan for, you know, plan in advance, which I have to do a lot. So I'm now thinking about workshops for next year. Yeah, you need to have an eye on what's coming. Otherwise, the months will pass by and nothing's going out. Mm. Yeah, you've always got to be about 10 steps ahead. Yeah, I'm finding that. I, I release patterns and if you need to sort of think, right, I want this to be released then. So I need to buy all the stuff by this time I need to advertise it <laughs> and you're working backwards up to the present yeah. day yeah exactly exactly and I still haven't quite got that I'm still a bit ah I need to <laughs> I need to get that out I've only got two days to do it but I'm hoping that will come with time but yeah I think considering you've got a pandemic raging and this is your first year of full time huge congratulations to you because that's amazing Thank you you're doing you're doing something that we'd all love to do and you're yeah you can tell that you're loving it and your cabin is amazing thank I you cabin. 
I saw you on, I think you were on the Indie Roller podcast and then I came to find you. And when I saw your cabin, I was just like, oh! Amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's a lovely, a lovely place to spend my days. And because I'm in the garden, like over here, I've got, um, there's a, I've got a little pond and the squirrels just run past and um, I can see all the birds. So it is, it is ideal, really. That's, that's why I don't really go inside anymore. <laughs> I've got my own kettle out here. Okay. So uh, can, I can survive out here. <laughs> I think my other question was going to be how did what do you need to put in place to start teaching courses so um so you've got to know what you're going to make um so this is this is like a bad example I won't name any names but I saw an advert for a workshop it wasn't even crochet actually it was an advert for a workshop showing this beautiful felted animal it was stunning and it was called sort of introduction into felting. Yeah. So you imagine that you were going to make yeah. this, but because it was an introduction to felting, you were just like making balls, I think. Uh. <laughs> so you've got to be my, so one of my top tips is be really, really clear about what you're making so that nobody's under any illusions as to what's going on so come to my workshop on saturday the 24th from 10 to 12 we are going to start making a yeah. scarf we're going to learn this stitch this stitch and this stitch there'll be tea and biscuits on offer there's a downstairs toilet if you need it um, we won't finish the scarf in the workshop but you'll go home with enough skills to be able to do it at your leisure do you see what i mean so you're you're not saying we're going to make this blanket in two hours on Saturday. Yeah. You kind of got to be really, I think you've got to be really clear and explicit about what, what will actually happen in the workshop. Yeah. You've got to plan it. Um, I always give a written, uh, written pattern um, with whatever we're doing in the workshop so they can take away and make it again. Um, so <clears throat> you need to make sure you've tested it. <laughs> Yeah. to make sure it works make sure you've read it through make sure it's easy to follow and the other thing I often do is when I give the pattern out I ask everybody just to check it through before they go is there anything you're not sure about have a look quickly because you don't want to get home and not know what to do so yeah it's just being really clear I think yeah you need to manage their expectations um yeah no that's really useful because i know there are some some people have asked me before i want to do workshops but it's not something i've ever done i've taught friends but i've never i've never gone any further than that yeah and i suppose the other thing is to think about um kind of what are you what are you going to do if they can't do it yeah <laughs> what's your backup plan or what are you going to do if they can do it yeah, what's your backup plan <laughs> speed ahead or if they're a bit slower yeah no that's really useful um and i think that only what's the worst part <laughs> of working for yourself um i suppose it can be a little bit lonely sometimes you know sometimes i can i can be out here for days on end and not really not see anybody yeah. <clears throat> um and it is hard work yeah. because i I have it's just me um so I have to do all my social media all my pack well I do have a friend who's helping me at the moment with packing kits and things but everything is is down to me I don't delegate anything to I haven't got any staff or anything like that so it can be quite lonely um and nobody really knows my business like me yeah. so I try you know so my husband's my go-to of right I've had this idea what do you think and he he's a ma he massive help you know he'll say well what about this and what about this but ultimately he doesn't know my business as well as I do so it's difficult to get advice from people I suppose which is why that the indie roller community is so good because there's so many people in similar positions so you can bounce ideas off people and ask questions and things um but yeah, I can't, there's not many downsides, I don't think. <laughs> no, I think it's, you juggle so many hats and people don't see the behind the scenes. Like you said, you have a whole day for admin. People don't realise how much there is to do, like your social media, um, looking at patterns, writing them up, 
planning. It, it all does take a lot of time. It's enjoyable, but it takes a lot of time. It does. It you does. You're not necessarily yeah. sat there crocheting all day. People think that you just crochet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly that is exactly what people and i get people going like sort of friends really and they go are you still are you still doing the um i'm like well that's knitting again for one that's knitting <laughs> um but i actually do very little crochet these days in fact you know i it's there's so much planning and designing and organizing and the the crochet is the smallest part yeah. which is a shame um but I do enough if you if you see what I mean. And if I want to make myself something, I will. But generally, I really these days I really like designing something, making it a couple of times for to test it works and everything, taking the photos, and then moving on to the next thing to see what else I can do. So that that suits me better than churning out a hundred scarves yeah. to try and sell. Yeah, I think I'm with you on that one. I know people that do make things and they're very successful. But making a hundred of the same thing, uh, no thanks. I'll design it and then, like you said, move on. And that's what keeps me going. Everyone's different. So it's just working to your strengths, I guess. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I used to do a lot of that. I used to sell it a lot of markets and things. And it was good, but you're not ever really being paid for the time you've put in. No. So it might take me four or five hours to make a scarf, but no one's going to pay me an hourly rate plus materials when they can get it cheaper in asda are they <laughs> there is that as well yeah definitely whereas with your designs you once they're out there in a way you keep generating income because you can always sell that again and again and if you're making the kits like you do that's even better i would love to make a kit for certain granny square jumpers and um I'm just holding this one because I was cold, so I put it on my lap. Um, and also bags. I made a granny square bag once, and it's on my mind a lot. So, yeah. Do it. Do it. Yeah. I might just have to jump in. I'm going to get some of that T-shirt yarn off you, though, because that looks amazing. It is. It's really fun to work with. Really fun. It does. Yep. Um, um, you've enabled me. I'm going to do that. Do you want to tell everybody where they can find your kits if they're like me and they need to get hold of some yep yeah, so um the main place really is my website which is www.thesecretcrocheter.com yeah. so everything about me is on there there's a sign up for my newsletter as well yeah. and then there's a there's a shop where you can buy all the kits i've also got a facebook page um the secret crochet and an instagram page which is at the underscroll secret underscroll crocheter and an etsy shop as well but you probably don't really need that just get on the website <laughs> i yeah i'm the same go to my website <laughs> well thank you so much i am sure everyone's taken loads from this and i hope thank you for having me no that's my pleasure um and i'm gonna go and sign up to your newsletter and look at your t-shirt yarn <laughs> okie dokie Who found that to be so, so inspiring because I did. Thank you so much, Nicola, for coming on to HGDC. I really, really valued your time and for everything that you shared. And it's definitely lit a fire under my butt and I hope it has for other people as well. I wish you all the success and I am eagerly watching your journey on Instagram now. Tribe, make sure you go ahead and find Nicola on Instagram and check out her website. Make sure you go look at those kits. Like, who else needs a gingerbread kit in that bauble? I mean, I think we all do. Um, yes, so thank you so much, Nicola, for coming on to HGDC to be a boss in the Crochet to Cash series. Tribe, I've got so many more of these lined up for you. So, as I always say, click the thumbs up, which is to give me a like, and um, make sure you subscribe. And if you did really enjoy this, then please comment below, thank you Nicola, and let me know um, if you've got any more questions or you want to see anybody else, because whatever you comment, I really do take it all on board and I try and deliver whatever it is that you want. So whether you've got more questions for Nicola and we need to get her to come back, which I would love to do, 
or if you've got questions on other areas, please let me know below. The more comments you put, the more information you give me, and also the more YouTube pushes this video out to more and more people. Um, and I wanna be able to spread this information as far and as wide as possible. So Tribe, I'm loving this series. I really hope you are, and I'll see you in the next one. I'm